the higher up the ladder you went, uh, the harder decent results were to come by. After being so successful earlier in your career and winning race after race after race locally in trucks, and then winning Gator races, and then winning Dash, Dash. races, you get to the Bush Series and, and the results oh, are struggle. Yeah, the results I think our are best really tough was to come by. Tenth at, well, it might have been uh, might have been a IRP in Watkins Glen. I think I had a top ten, but yeah, it was again. It was um, limited series, not running full time. Yeah. And then when I did run full time, we uh, there was always issues to where you would hear, you know, from the your engine builder that well, you know, they're not giving you, they're not giving you the same parts that they're giving. I think it was uh, uh, Hermie Sadler was it, this was with Don Beverly. So Hermie was in one car and I was in another. That goes back to my dad always saying, unless you're going to be the number one, don't do it. Because they're going to... Yeah. And, and, and the, the engine builder was honest with me. He said, they say put whatever parts in hers. Don't, and in his, it was the newer parts. And you hear that stuff. And, and I think a lot of people knew that, that I wasn't given the... Uh, and I, you know, it always used to be about media. Like, you'd have the sponsor. And, you know, maybe I brought the sponsor because of being marketable yeah. but I was always like you know all this media comes around but it's not really an ad- because it comes before you do anything it's coming because you're a girl not because you're dry like you're so why don't you give me the equipment to perform and they'll come like you build it they'll come <laughs> but um you know it was in and out Michael Cranifus I had some decent equipment there um just Ronnie Silver, I always ran with limited schedule, limited funds. And, you know, I think when it went through the process, then with BAM, that was a totally weird situation to where they came to me and I was running for Cranifus. So I left Cranifus to go to BAM. And I was like, why, why don't you put, like, this is at the time, Ted Musgrave in the car uh, and run me full time in a Bush car so we can be competitive? And they're like, no, they didn't want any part of that. They wanted to go cup racing, and they wanted to go cup racing with me. So we had a rookie crew chief, rookie team manager, rookie owners, rookie driver. We went to Daytona with no sponsor. Um, the Morgenthau's had money, so they were prepared for that. And we qualified. We made the race on time. And we finished 24th, but it was experience. It was just the whole goal there was to finish. And, and then I think we qualified 16th at um, Atlanta. And then it rained out. I remember that. That rained out. But, um, yeah, it was, it was this challenge. And then I think what was it was six to ten races in, the emotional thing started coming up to where it was like I knew we tested. Uh, I don't remember if it was at Chicago we, we were tested somewhere, and we were running really good. And when we went back, it was a different car. It wasn't the same car. I'm like, this isn't the same. Why would you, you change? Why, why did we change it? We were running really good. And they're like, oh, no, it's the same car. And, and I, I went to the owners, and I'm like, it's not. They're like, no, the number's different, but it's the same car. And I'm like, no, it's not the same car. This is a totally different car out of the shop. I know yeah. it. Yeah. And there would be to where the shock guy was told to change the shocks right before we started the race, after we had ran so well. The you know, rules were different then. You could do those kind of things. So there was just a lot of stuff that I felt like was against me. So when I, when I spoke up about it with anger, basically, going into the team manager and saying, this is bullshit. I mean, not that I want to cuss but that's how I felt well that's what it was yeah. <laughs> and you know then it kind of just became well we know we're gonna we had a contract so that's when they put uh, Hornaday well Hornaday came involved uh, he came to a couple races and, and was on the radio we, we were testing I think so that's when he tested a lot and he's like he would get in the car and do whatever and he's like she's telling you exactly what the car's doing you guys just aren't listening to her. So it was a matter of respect yeah. of is the communication between the crew chief and the driver working? Not so much. 
So, so one of them's going to go. So the crew chief went first, then different crew chief, and then later it was me being replaced by Hornaday, and then on from there. And, and then that's when I later went on to um, Keith Coleman in the Vassarette car. Yeah. And I think if I would say that was around 2005, 2004, 2005, that's pretty much what, what did me into the, I don't want to say burnout, but I think exhausted for f- fighting for so long. And then you're put in a, in a car that you know is not even close to capable of. I didn't know that going in, yeah. but it was basically wanting to be a starting park. And I'm like, that's not who I am. That's not. And so I walked away from that. And the next race, they put um, Green, uh, Mark Green, in the, va- in the Vassarette car at Talladega. And they ended up getting disqualified for illegal roof flaps. And they were parked, like put on display. Yeah. And I told the Vassarette sponsor that they're, mess- they're rigging the cars. I know they're doing stuff. And I know that's not a good thing. Like, I didn't like drama. I didn't want to be. Yeah. But I knew that it wasn't, they weren't giving me the, they weren't giving me the equipment that they said they were going to give me. So yeah. I, at that point, I kind of just evaluated where I was. I think I tried through 2005 to get another sponsor to get with a quality team. Didn't come up with the funding. And then I kind of looked like, you know, my kids were getting to the age of sports and and playing ball all the time and I wanted to be involved with that I didn't want to be at the racetrack and not have a chance to at least be competitive in some way I I didn't want to go there and just ride around the back that's not yeah that's how people get hurt I mean it's just not a good idea (laughs) so that's when I kind of stepped away from it so 1994 um you're with Ed Vury you, yeah, Ed Furry was a good a good owner. That was a decent car. You you go to Rockingham, second race yeah. of the year, and you qualified second. Yeah, we got the pole at Atlanta. Yeah, but you at, at at Rockingham you qualified second. Yeah. So maybe that's a light at the end of the tunnel. We're we're we're, we're on to something yeah. here. What do you remember about that? Weekend? I remember we dropped a cylinder in qualifying, yeah. so I was flat out. You That's, dropped a cylinder yeah. in qualifying, still yeah. qualified second? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so um, Terry Allen was my crew chief then, and he, he and I had a good relationship. He, he believed in me, and, and I knew that. Like, he, had, he wanted to give me the best race car he could. But I'd say um, I think we ended up crashing at Rockingham, and I think I broke some ribs there. But, uh, or maybe that was Martinsville. But uh, Ed Furry was, was good. Um, you know, I just never got... I, again, I don't think Ed, we, I don't think we were running full-time either. I think we were doing whatever we could to be out there full-time. But we weren't full-time. And that always was a yeah. negative disadvantage. All right, so you go to Rockingham. Or, all right, so you go to Atlanta. And you do sit on the pole. Nope. First, first time a, a female driver's ever won the pole in the Bush Series. Up until the green flag, what was that weekend like for oh, you? Oh, it was crazy. It was, it was crazy. People Magazine came and did like a feature story on me. And there was just so much media. And, and it was all good. I mean, it was all, it was great. I just wanted to get in the car and drive. You know, like, that was the hardest part. You had so many appearances and things to do and blah, blah, blah. And then, to me, it was like when you get in the car and you're, you're buckled in and, you, you know, you're saying, get ready to go. That's when it's like, focus. And, um, you know, all I wanted to do was, was run a great race. That's all I wanted to do. And then, then drama started. <laughs> You know, you, there you know there were people in the grandstands, no question about it, that had bets on what lap she gonna crash on, or what's gonna yeah. happen, or she's gonna call it's the big one, or, and then, um, you know how that race went. But what happened is after the crash, uh, Joe Nemechek, well Kyle Petty was uh, com- was yeah, yeah. pit road reporter, and Kyle Petty runs over to me before he starts the interview, and he said. 
I don't know if you know this, but Joe Nemechek just told me that Mike Wallace went up to him and said, he's taking you out on the first lap. Well, what pissed Joe Nemechek off is took him out too. So that's why he said it. I mean, that's why. He, so then Kyle tells me that right before he starts to interview me. And so I was just like, you know, you go from here to here in the, the biggest, one of the biggest moments of your life. And then you're at the, it's over. Like, all you want is just another chance. Like, can we just restart? <laughs> Do it over again. <laughs> and, yeah. and it was, it, it was, there was a lot of little arguing and some fighting going on there. I think Mike Wallace's wife and I had words and. That day? Uh, oh yeah. Right. After Kyle's interview. Wow. Yeah. Um, she was a spitfire. So yeah, I, we didn't get in a fight or anything, but we were, there were definitely words. Wow. Ward said, and I think Wallace lost a few fans that day, possibly. So is that something that NASCAR brought you and Mike in to talk about, or did you ever talk to him about that? I don't remember ever talking to him about it. Really? Mm-mm. No. It was just unfortunate. It was like, we got to go to the next one. And Do you... Go ahead. No, I, I, I'm trying to think, but I don't. I don't. They may have brought us in the trailer. And maybe Joe, too. But I don't think, I don't remember. Did he get a penalty? Did. Yeah. I, I mean, there were no fines that I know of, it, but honestly, don't remember. Okay. All right. When you think about that day, what do you think? About? Heartbreak. Are you, are you able to separate the fact that you won the poll? from the memory of the accident or, or um, are I mean, they it's so still intertwined? gratitude that I won the poll and and I'm still very grateful for that and for the team yeah but just heartbroken for the team at that moment because you know our hopes were so high it wasn't about leading the first lap it was about running the whole race yeah yeah and I had a good car so it was just it was just heartbreaking the following season, 1995, from what I understand, the plan was to run a full Bush Series schedule and a handful of cup events. But early in the season, you wound up, I think, stepping out of the car. That was with? I, off the top of my head, I couldn't. I, I think it's when you were expecting. Oh, no. No, I can tell you that story. Okay. All right. Okay. Oh, no. No, um, so it had to be 90, Five. so 95, I think I was with a couple different owners, limited schedules, once again, not great equipment, CPR Motorsports, which that's kind of a funny name, um, we were running limited, I was trying to bring more sponsorship to go, and every time I was at the racetrack, I would go to James Finch, and, uh, Mark Reno, the crew chief, they, were, they had Purvis yeah. in the ARCA car. And, and they had him in a Bush car and I think a Cup car. And, and so Purvis had went up to Cup and so they had the ARCA car. And I would always go up and say, you know, just give me a chance. Just give me a chance. You put me, you have, you don't unload from a trailer and not run up front. You have excellent equipment if you, you know, just give me a chance, just give me a chance, just give me a chance. So I was basically trying to like knock that door down. So um, 98, still trying to knock that door down. Oh no, this couldn't be 98, it was 95 that that all happened, that I was like trying to get Finch, put me a car, trying to get Finch. Okay, so it starts out where the season's over, they're getting ready to test at Daytona, and uh, Mark Reno calls me and says, uh, hey, you know, we thought about that, how aggressive you are at trying to, so, um, you know, we got Purvis running the cup race. Do you want to go test the ARCA car? And I'm like, oh, my God. And I had kind of stepped away because I didn't have any sponsorship. So I think that time I was 30 and, you know, had been married for two years and to Jeff. And so it was kind of like that, well, if there's ever going to be a time, because I, I always knew I wanted to still race after just because I you know had 
kids doesn't mean I was going to stop racing in the future. So anyway, I had um, just taken a pregnancy test a couple days before Mark Reno called. So I didn't answer right away, and I went to the drugstore and bought like five more. (laughs) (laughs) And, you know, I knew it was very early. I could have went and tested that car. I could have probably raced it, but mentally I couldn't do that. So I called him back and I'm like, all right, you know how bad I want this. And I'm like, but I gotta be, I I said, I'm, I'm pregnant. And he's just, it was like silence. And then he's like, well, that's ex- the first excuse from a driver I ever got. <laughs> <laughs> so, ended up, in the future, Tanner was born in 96, Samantha was born in 97, I drove for James Finch in 99 in the Bob Evans ARCA car and finished second under caution. We would have won or crashed. There's no question about it. <laughs> at, but we didn't get the chance. At Daytona? At Daytona. Wow. So he gave me the chance. And then that's what stepped me to... Um, Cranifus coming in, and uh, Cranifus came in, and we ran uh, Kmart, and Marty Gaunt was my team manager, uh, Joe Dan Bailey was my crew chief, with great, great crew chief, great team, all my guys kind of came from the NASCAR Institute, they were all young, you know, first time in, and, and they're all still working for Childress, yeah. Hendrick, they're all still out there and still running, but their memories were of me in that Kmart car, and we had some fun times. While you were out of the car in the mid to late mm-hmm. 90s, how bad did you miss it? Oh, I missed it a lot, um, but I was, I was happy. I mean, I was, yeah. I was happy. I was pregnant. I think I started, that's when I kind of started doing the decorating, little uh, here and there. I mean, the whole time I was pregnant, with both of my children, I was I was faux finishing, painting. I, I did Larry and Linda McReynolds house. I did Buffy and Michaels at the time. So I was, I kind of started this other career, but then I would still go to the racetrack because, you know, still out of sight, out of mind, but it was different because, you know, I wasn't driving. It, it's hard to be at a racetrack, but because Jeff was with Yates and, uh, and then at one point he was with Rusty Wallace and then back to Yates, I always kind of had a place to be. I don't like being at the racetrack without having a destiny, you know, yes, like ma'am. a place. I yeah. hate yeah. it. Yeah. I feel like, what am I supposed to do with myself? And then, you know, you know people, uh, so you might go stand on so-and-so's trailer or go, but it's just like, ugh, yeah. there's nothing worse. Yeah. You came back, you raced Daytona in 99, the ARCA race, you finished second. You get back into it, year 2000, 2001, and at that time, the year 2000 was pretty tough in the sport when we lost Adam and Kenny yeah. and uh, Tony. Then, in course, in 2001, we lost Dale and Blaze. Yeah. How much of a – role did that play in your decision to come back or was that even a factor? Not even a factor. Didn't even think about it? Never even think about it. Okay. You never did. You never uh, it's just something that you're doing what you love and you have the opportunity to have a career that's you know something that you're passionate about you never think about the what ifs. If you did you don't need to be out there. It's just right. you know I remember when Nemechek's brother died at Charlotte I think wasn't it? Homestead. Homestead. Yeah. John. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, it's so hard. You feel, but it doesn't affect me as a driver. It didn't, it didn't ever affect me as a driver. That didn't change my thoughts. So you have the deal with Cranifus, and then you move over to the BAM car, and that evidently didn't work out. Um, then you ran another handful of Bush Series races in 2005, but then you stepped away from the sport. Yeah, and I did that truck thing with Aaron's. Okay, yeah. The, yeah. the carnival. <laughs> you know, not that you didn't want it. You wanted to give every shot you could. You know, it was hard yeah. to say no when you had the opportunity to get back out there. And I always looked at it like, if I can drive a not-so-great car, then what's going to be like when I can get in a, in good equipment? 
So it always, I'd never like say, I'm not going to do it because your stuff's not good enough. I wanted to, to do what, drive whatever I could drive and be out there because you feel like, I've always felt like you got to get from one point to get to the next. So prove yourself, show your passion and you'll get there. So I, I, you know, wanted to run the trucks and they did that all girl dream team. And um, I think they had told me that they had a certain amount of uh, seconds on their pit stops. So they're all, they all in Texas. So, you know, I'm in North Carolina and I'm like, well, that's Stanford. That's pretty good. Well, they didn't tell me that it was a two tire stop, not a four tire stop. Yeah. That it was just stuff like that, and it's like these girls were tough. I mean, you got to give them credit. And I remember back with Bill Venturini had a female team. There was nothing wrong with that, and there are women that could absolutely get that job done. Yeah. It was just that thing was kind of taken as a marketing tool alone. Yeah. And again, yeah. you know, do it. Put put the good stuff out there, and then the, you know, the media will come. The attention will come. When when you did quit driving, I hate the word quit. I did step away, and I guess at that point I was. That's when the Vassarette car and and I I had no respect for the owner um, at all. So it wasn't that hard to walk away from it. And that's the one where they put Mark Green in and they got disqualified and all that. I had no res- respect for that situation, and I didn't want to be in it. So that's so. So when you made the decision to step out of the car for good. Yes. How big an adjustment was that? I mean, did mm. did you go through a period where you were on the fence? And, Absolutely. Boy, if I could just get oh, Richard Childress to call. Who or, am I? Or if I could. Who, I, I didn't really have, you know, I started racing at 18, which is old these days. But back then it wasn't. And I, my identity was that. It was like. I didn't really feel like where, who, you know, like what. I didn't want to go to the racetrack because I didn't have a place to be. I didn't have a reason to be there other than, you know, I, there's always that. That's the only what if I have is if I would have just, you know, gave it another six months, year to try to get back out there in a good, in good equipment. But I, um, I had a visual of... Um, a garage door closing, kind of like one like that, that, that rolls up and rolls down. So the way that I had to look at that was, all right, you got to focus on what are you going to do now? What are you going to do next? And and I had been doing jobs with my kids when I was pregnant, and I'd been doing decorating jobs. And um, there was this chair that I loved that Anthropology had, but it was too too expensive that I wanted it. And one my best friend. Um, had said, oh my God, you are so creative with, with fabrics and colors and I don't know how you can, like she's all neutrals and she, got, she can't mix. She's like, you, you do it yourself, do that. So I kind of had to close that door and then walk through another one yeah. and focus on that. And it, and it turned out that I started doing, I, I you know, submitted to some, some big shows and uh, started creating furniture and and kind of made a, a staple of my own with that and traveled and did shows and then I got into the online sales and uh, it just kind of created a whole second passion. So drivers like um, Danica Patrick come along, Haley Deegan come mm. along, and Gracie Trotter comes along, you mentioned her. Do you feel ownership in their careers in the sense that you know, I, I helped pave the way for them. No, I, I don't. Do you not? No, I don't think. I mean, I know that I, help, I hope, I hope that, um, that they have respect for me, and I hope that they think that. But, I mean, I, I, it was such a different time. I always bring up that there was no social media. Yeah. And now all these, these drivers are dealing with being able to market themselves in so many ways and have really a one-on-one fan experience to where you could literally follow them on and off the track and you know we didn't have anything like that and I I, I do hope that um, you know Kelly Earnhardt probably was one that when I got the poll at 
uh, in the Bush race, she was running late models, you know, with mom and pops at, the, at Hickory. And, and I had actually went and spotted for her a couple times um, at Hickory. And um, uh, she sent me a fax. This is when you, you know, it was a fax. A fax? A fax came in on the fax machine. And it was Terry Allen. This is when I drove Fred Free. And we, I got that fax, and it was her congratulating me and how much she looked up to me wow. as, as a driver. Yeah. And that that was huge. And I do think that I impacted that era. It was like 90s. Um, Sherry Pollock's another one. Her dad owned, uh, Greg Pollock's owned Bush yeah, Cars. Yeah, yeah. And she was probably 13, 14. And she has a picture. This is why I had the Polaroid shirt on and had the perm. And she's got the perm. <laughs> my jeans are up to here, which is now back in style. But she like looked up to me. Like girls like that that weren't necessarily all racers, and Kelly was at the time, and we know the path that Kelly took, which worked out well. I think she was definitely a hell of a driver. But um, I think, you know, I hope, I hope I have uh, opened some doors. Uh, I'm, you know, Danica, I know, we, we'd met, we did a couple conferences with uh, Lynn St. James. Uh, Danica had respect for me. Uh, I think she thought I was a racer. Uh, she definitely verbalized that she didn't think some other girls were racers. And uh, at the time, Erin Crocker was younger and just coming. She was running sprint cars. And we were all in this same... It was drag racers, sprint car It was every type of racing. All these women were together. And uh, Danica, she was great. She, Lynn really was like, she's the up and coming. She She... I, and I can't speak for her, but I think at that time, her her eyes weren't set on NASCAR in, in any way. It was set on open wheel, Formula One. That was her direction. And I think that when she was approached, and I think Kelly had a lot to do with that, is bringing her in, um, which she had to convince Dell Jr. and uh, his crew chief. And, you know, I don't know that they were totally behind it, but she kind of knew it's time. You know, I'm sure her relationship with NASCAR in general, Mike Helton, it's time. And she brought her in, and I think with, with GoDaddy, it was too good of a situation to pass up, and she was a racer, so why not? And going in and starting with Junior Motorsports, and then going to Tony Stewart, and having every type of mentor in your ear coaching you along the way, wow, that's awesome. I mean... Definitely different than than the way that I did it, but I would. There's no no jealousy there. I think it was. I think I did get when she got uh, the or she was starting on the pole at Daytona. Is that the first time she ran? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. But it was by points. It wasn't yeah. by time. But still, it was like all this hype on first woman ever and first NASCAR driver female. I'm like. Hello, <laughs> and so that that was yeah. it. It wasn't yeah. that I yeah. that I was taking that out on Danica. You can't right. blame her, but yeah. it's like, well, what what about the other? You know, there was what Tammy Jo Kirk back though. There was still, I think, I made a mark for. I think a Janet Guthrie told me once. She's like, I just wish you would have been out there a little longer. Yeah. I just wish you would have been out there a little longer. 